and welcome. Am I really looking forward to this broadcast? And I believe sometimes in life, you have no control on what's about to happen. And I first and foremost want to honor God, Jesus, for what he's going to arrange this afternoon. And I want to thank our brother Stan Lovins, who is really a person that I believe will honor Jesus and bring forth his words and his plans for this broadcast. So let's bring on our guest, Brother Stan Lovins, is it pronounced? Uh, it's Lovins. Lovins. Yes. Okay, Lovins. So before I go into asking any question at all, what is the spirit of God putting on your heart? Then we'll go right into prayer if we may. Well, the spirit of God's putting on my heart and, and the urgency to activate and equip the body of Christ to flow in the power of the living God, the resurrection power, the Holy Ghost power with the fire of God to bring transformation to not only this nation, but around the globe. Do you sense there's a sense in the atmosphere of urgency? Have you been feeling that word urgency in your spirit, brother? Well, a friend of mine and I, he, had a, he wrote a book on it called Urgency, but uh, uh, we that's been in our spirit for about five years. The urgency to bring transformation and um, to, to literally activate, like I said, uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost. The body corporately has missed the power of God. They've they, they may testify of Jesus, but they're they're trying to debate Jesus. But God wants to bring an instilling of the power and the boldness of the Holy Ghost. So signs, wonders, healings, miracles, deliverance, and salvation to the heart and soul of an everyday person. And without that, a nation will fail. I mean, we can't serve two masters. There's one master, Jesus Christ. Well, I would be honored if you could open up uh, with prayer. Well, Lord, we come before you today. We thank you, first of all, for this opportunity to, to speak your gospel, your good news, your great news, the holy news of the written word that comes alive, that's alive and active, sharp, sharper than any twigged sword, that penetrates between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and even judges the thoughts and attitudes of a person's heart. God, I thank you for perfecting that which pertains to um, this ministry, uh, one source online. Lord, that you shall bring forth your glory, the one source, the truth, the power of the resurrection to every listener, everyone that's viewing, everyone that shall see it down the road, down the pipe, God, that you shall transform it and bring a, a literally a strike of your glory upon our hearts to free us from every entrapment, every ensnarement, every hurt, pain, shame, every form of abuse, every form of condemnation. We strip it down right now in the name of Jesus, and I thank you. For we take authority over hex, vex, curse, every form of witchcraft, every form of incantation or meditation that's not of you, Jesus. We strip it down right now. We come against all the forces of darkness, and we thank you, Lord, for bringing healing to the hurting and transformation to the here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You just mentioned, which I caught quickly. Almost like a baseball catcher, I caught it. <laughs> you, you mentioned the word healing. Yes. And the first thing I like to do when I receive a word that sort of resonates with my spirit, the first thing I do, I look at myself first, Brother Stan. And I take in that one moment the log out of my eye. And what I recognize is this. Yeah. God put each and every one of us in a certain platform, but it's his platform. And I really believe now maybe it's my age or just trusting God more. I believe the most important thing, especially for leaders, is to bring forth the word, but also to be humble. Yes, Share sir. with us how humility is a must now. We can't ignore it. Well, when you have pride, the Bible clearly says pride always comes before a fall. And so when men people are ministering, even on online, social media, um, pride can set in because they grow, they get influence, and then they focus on the influence instead of the one who created us to influence and impact the world for the kingdom of God. And so what we do is we get confused with that. And we uh, I see a lot of false humility, even in leadership within the church. 
and um, they'll they'll talk a good game from the platform. But when you meet them in the green room, I call it the the who's who in the green room, right? Who's the who's who in the zoo in the green room? They begin to talk about different things that doesn't line up with humbleness and truth. They it's about pride and, and it's, it becomes a competitive spirit and uh, selfish ambition. And then they, they begin to hijack one of those quote unquote content instead of humbling themselves and literally give a reverence to God and, and, and continue to give him all glory. Jesus Christ gets all the glory, all the honor, all the praise in everything that we do. You know, last time I checked, you know, there's one ministry is Jesus. Jesus the Christ, crucified, rose again, the resurrected Messiah. And there's one body corporately. And then it doesn't matter what nation, you know, Asian, Caucasian, or any persuasion. It doesn't matter. Jesus Christ is after his people to come alive for him and to know him. And so we need to humble ourselves and realize that God's working in people's lives, even if they're not as far as long maturity as one might think that they should be. Yes. Leave room for God's mercy and let the grace, which is the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, empower an individual to come alive and to fulfill what Jesus himself has, has uh, died on the cross and rose again to give them abundant life. And so our responsibility is love the people. I like to say Jesus truly loves the hell out of people so we don't have to hold on to hell. <laughs> we don't have to hold on to condemnation. We don't have to hold on to these things and pride and arrogance and you know, we're not here to build our empire. We're here to, to build up the kingdom of God. It's not about an empire. It's about the kingdom. And so if it's about the kingdom, then I'll be able to cheer you on, my brother Greg. I, I'll be able to cheer on the body of Christ, no matter what they're doing for the kingdom. You know, no matter what level or how much revelation they have or don't have, I can cheer that on. But pride is about arrogance and taking the content and hijacking it and manipulating and repackaging it and selling it as if they had a revelation. That's a that's one form of pride. The other thing is continue to take um, any influence of glory um, away from Jesus. Jesus heals. I believe wholeheartedly Jesus desires to heal everyone. Everyone that's ever been hurt, broken, any form of shame, pain, abuse, torment, forced shame, as well as any form of sickness, whether it be um, cancer or uh, leukemia or um, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis or broken bones or any form of virus or injection or infection, Jesus Christ is able to heal all. His desire is to heal. And so just like his desire is to save all, but not all will be saved. We know that. But the, the difference is, is uh, those who hear the word understand by trusting the word is alive. And they receive it. That's Jesus. And when they receive Jesus, let him fulfill what he's commissioned them to, to do as well. So we're here to activate and equip the body, help them overcome those obstacles or uh, misunderstandings so that they can see clearly, but to do so in love. You said something, uh, Brother Lovin. You mentioned once again a very important word that each day I'm getting a, a better understanding more clarification on what the word love means. Not long ago, I remember hearing this powerful word at a conference. I knew the scriptures so well. You know, he could go verse to verse and talk about a subject and compare the scripture that matched it. Yeah. So I can recall congratulating him for that powerful word. But then I shared with him, brother, I remember not recently, recently, I should say, I caught myself getting a bit angry. And then all of a sudden I caught myself maybe saying something that I shouldn't say. Brother, I caught myself knowing that uh, I should have repented earlier. Then I didn't hear nothing, Brother Lovins. We can know that word like you mentioned. You are so, so right. But I got to remember I still am in process. Along with knowing that word, along with showing love in that one moment, why can't we really at times, even in the pastor's role, 
share with people. I can deliver this word, but I'm still working on myself. People respect that so much more. I think what's happening now, and I could be mistaken, we reached a place in leadership, such as a pastor, and there's a heavy responsibility, I believe, when you're anointed and God selects you to be a pastor, not yourself or not a man. But I also believe we cannot forget about our own process. We cannot forget that sometimes we're the last ones to receive healing. What's your mm-hmm. thought, uh, Brother Lovins? Well, I like to say, you know, only a free man can free someone. If I'm wounded, and I've, uh, I take up a defense and I've got this problem and I'm arguing with my wife and I'm arguing with this, got this anger and the rage. And we all deal with different things on a daily basis. But if I do that, can I really help somebody fully get free? Um, you know, it, it takes a pure heart and seeking after God, a repentant heart to stay right before the Lord. You know, every day, you know, we're in different restaurants or we're walking through the mall or we're going to the grocery store and they're playing music in the background and that music, there's all kinds of different things. There's things that takes me back to my past, my pre Jesus days. Right. And so those seeds, those are seeds that are being planted in a person. And if I don't take captive of those uh, thoughts, if I don't take captive to those seeds and cast those underfoot, um, then it can root up. And um, that's why he says, pick up your cross and carry it daily. Mm-hmm. Continue to to be renewed day by day, right? With a renewing of your mind, and it's not New Age. It's called Holy Ghost teaching, right? To to be renewed by the Word and the washing of the Word that renews our mind to stay steadfast in His will, His way for Yahweh Jesus. And so, as we continue to seek after Him, trust and abide in Him, then we can help others because we'll hear clearly the voice of the Lord. There's not those thickets of the briars and the thistle weeds of bitterness and unforgiveness and all the things that are rooted up in people's hearts because they've never taken authority over that. And so we have got to take authority over those and and not take up an offense. In ministry, I'll just speak from, you know, in in quote unquote leadership and ministry, so many times we miss it because we, we want to take the charge instead of letting the Holy Spirit take charge of us and give us a leadership way. And, and, Jesus said the greatest amongst you will be what? A servant of all. Mm. And we're here to serve, serve in love with compassion and a boldness as well. We're not here to compromise. We're not here to shrink back. We're not here to take the word and dissect it and remove the things that we don't want to uh, apply to our lives. No, we're to apply the whole word, all 66 books of the Bible, the whole complete word to come alive on us and compiled in, in by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, uh, Lord Jesus spoke and he said, my true worshipers will, will worship me in spirit and in truth. And so we have got to walk on a daily uh, surrender to Jesus. And uh, the word of God says that uh, to discharge all the duties of your ministry. And if you're born again, I believe you are a minister of the gospel. Now it's a matter of growing and maturing and that understanding of what that means. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, we're here. To, the Great Commission is for every born again believer. And, and so the every born again believer needs the power of the Holy Ghost. We need the power of the Holy Ghost and his refining fire to come in, to scorch out, torch out every seed that's been injected in me, spoken over me, spoken over you or anybody else that's listening and Jesus wants to burn out the things that are not of him. He wants to scorch them out. At the same time, he wants to refine the God-giving uh, seeds of truth and the gifts to come alive that are on the inside of us. And if we're not walking in that understanding, we're not going to begin to mature into the fullness of what God has in store for his kingdom. Wow. Now, I thank you for sharing. That came straight from your heart. You know, yes, sir. Feel the Holy Spirit move. I have a question for you, uh, Brother Stan. If I'm in a leadership position, for some reason, leadership is coming up uh, for this moment. I don't know what's going to happen in the next moment, but leadership. Just being around a lot of pastors myself and also looking at the times where I was placed in a leadership role. 
I believe we're at a point in time where a lot of our pastors are suffering from depression. A lot of them deal with, I'm not understood. But I share with them, sometimes you're not understood because you're not sharing your vulnerabilities. Absolutely. You don't have to always be strong. Sometimes to say, you know what? Today I spent a lot of times in deliverance. Today I spent a lot of time counseling people. But what we don't realize is sometimes we need to be counseled too. We need to be able to share our thoughts, our feelings. We need to even say sometimes I don't like to deliver the word today because I'm just depleted. Am mm -hmm. I speaking the truth, Brother Stan? Yeah, absolutely. And I believe a lot of that is because um, we're not spending the time corporately in the word to understand that, you know, David had flaws. Everyone in this scripture had flaws, but Jesus, Jesus is the only perfect one. And he perfected that which pertains to us. But the bottom line is um, we, we've all fallen short, um, but it's the power of the Holy Ghost that will begin to work in us. And if we spend time with the Lord, I'm not talking about just spending prayer, prayer time in your closet. Come on, we, we need to get out of the closet at times too. Come on, we <laughs> need to say that and, and, and pray as we walk, as we walk things out. I mean, some of the most profound things that God gives me to download is that when I'm out mowing grass or I'm, I'm playing ball with my boys or I'm out or on the, um, you know, on, on doing my honeydew list with, for my wife and going and getting a job done. And God will give me download after download after download. And he'll even speak to me on things that where I've missed it. I mean, recently I'm just going to be transparent because I believe you have to be real, raw, transparent um, to, to bring transformation. And go. so, you know, the reality is this, you know, we all struggle. I've been frustrated because there's times that many times I've been wounded by different ministries because of the hijacking spirit or they want the content that God's given you a download and then they want to repackage it and they put it in the marketing they become a marketer of it and they put it in books and this as if they got that revelation but they, they literally take it from people and praise God the word's getting out but it gets frustrating when it's consistently I mean, I see a lot of that and it's really a sign of the source of spirit that's at work and they want you to lay hands and they want that anointing because we see literally Jesus heal thousands upon thousands and we see deliverances and we see transformation, but it's Jesus doing it. And when we begin to get in the, the flesh where it becomes, you know, well, in, in our ministry meeting the other day, we had 24 people make confession of faith and, uh, you know, as if we did it, but mm -hmm. Jesus saves, Jesus heals in obedience. Yes, God works through us. We're his ambassadors for his kingdom. But I believe many people get worn down because they begin to take on the identity that God didn't assign for them. Jesus is the great I am. And That's I know I have all authority in Jesus name. Now, what I'm about ready to speak may come across to someone who doesn't have ears to hear as arrogance, but it's not. That's called confidence. Many people said, Brother Stan, you, you see, you know, a lot of healings and miracles and and they'll say, um, brother, um, you, you, you must be a really strong believer. And I tell them, I shifted from being just a believer into being a knower. And because I know that I know that I know that my God is a healer. I know that I know that I know that my God, Jesus, will bring salvation and transformation to the heart and soul. So that's about um, coming in confidence that Jesus is able to do it. And if you walk in alignment with that, you don't allow doubt in your heart, but we got to shift and make sure that we give him all the glory. And to do the will of God, we got to step into this thing with confidence that God is able to. And in all fairness, um, how I came to know Jesus, I witnessed a dead woman come back to life in my arms. And God literally did a work of resurrection on me as well. Um, I was a professional baseball player. A minor leaguer, so I wasn't in the major leagues. So, you know, if you look me up in the major leagues, I, I wasn't there. I'm serving Jesus in a great capacity, and I'm in my major leagues now serving Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the car accident took me out of playing pro ball, and I was, I was in a spirit of despair. You talk about despair. I, I was broken. I had no hope. 
all my identity was caught up in the sport and athleticism and what I could do and perform and how I could make money for the different professional teams that I played for. And when the car accident happened, I had no value and no known value. I should say I had no idea who, who Jesus was. I, I thought I did, but I cried out to God for truth. And then three days later, God revealed his truth. And I witnessed this precious 81-year-old widow woman, Margaret Rose Cox, come back to life in my arms by the anointing, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And God breathed life back into me and healed my right shoulder. He healed my neck, my back, and my knee at the same time. So when I had the introduction of the resurrection power of grace, which is Jesus working, then I gave my heart to Jesus December 1st of 1997. How much more shall I believe today that I witnessed a dead woman come back to life and God heal me before I knew him? And now that I know him, I know that he's able to do what he says he's able to do because he'll do miracles for anybody that's even watching right now or listening. He'll do miracles for you just because he loves you that much. He loves you so much that he wants to heal you. He wants to fill you. He wants to uh, seal you with this power of the Holy Ghost through the relationship of Jesus the Christ. And so by doing so, uh, and you trust in him, he's able to perfect that which pertains to us. And that was the exciting things that really worked in my heart when I read that passage, that Jesus shall perfect that which pertains to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where the spirit mm -hmm. of the Lord is, there's liberty, not bondage. Yes. And I believe that so many people get in bondage. So being transparent is, yes, we struggle. But Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to set us free from that struggle. He came. He didn't tell us to focus on the struggle. He told us to fix our eyes on Jesus, who will perfect that which pertains to us. And he will heal us. He will mend us as we surrender to him. You said a key word earlier, my brother Greg, and I love your humble heart. I thank God for you and what you're doing for the kingdom of God. But you said something earlier about repentance. And a lot of times when I'm ministering, you know, I hear uh, street preachers, they'll say, repent, right? And I know that's a godly term, repent. I believe 100% in it. But the truth be told, most people don't even know what that, they don't even know what that means. That's right. And and really repentance is turning from darkness and running to the light. Turning from things that are going to devour you. Um, you know, I remember I was at a Super Bowl event uh, up in Indianapolis and, and several years back. And there was a street preacher out there, Greg, and he was he was condemning everybody. I mean, he wasn't preaching the good news. He was he was preaching the sad news, right? He was telling them, you're all, you know, all sinners, which is true. We're sinners and we need Jesus. I, I, I get that. But he was preaching it from a spirit of condemnation. Let me clarify that because the gospel speaks for itself. And God's judgment is against condemnation. That's John 3, 19, 3, 18. And um, so anyway, he, he's uh, he's preaching against me. And there's this guy over on on, on his right. And he said, you know, this guy had a beer in his hand and he was drunk. And he said, you're going straight to the pits of hell for that beer in your hands. And I'd had enough. And I, I, I corrected this guy. I rebuked him openly. I said, sir, that's not preaching the gospel and the good news. And he goes, I'm an evangelist. I'm an evangelist. I said, brother, I'm an evangelist as well. But it's not about being an evangelist. It's about proclaiming Jesus. And I said, you're not preaching Jesus, you're preaching condemnation. And he, he looked at me and, and he started yelling at, at me. And I said, I mute your tongue in the name of Jesus. Because I, I seen it was a religious demon. And I said, I command that, that tongue to be ceased and not to spew any more venom anymore. And as soon as I did that, he couldn't speak. He stops, he grabs his, his speaker and he walks away. Now, some would be listening and said, brother, you're coming against the kingdom of light. I'm like, no. We had to strip down the kingdom of darkness that was preaching a false gospel. And I went over to that guy that that uh, had that beer can. He was drunk. He was staggering. And I put my arm around him. I said, listen, man, that beer, it's not going to send you to heaven. And it's definitely, I mean, it's de not going to send you to hell. And it's definitely not going to send you to heaven. And he looked at me and I said, but I don't have to tell you this. By drinking and consuming too much of that, it's going to alter your mind and it's going to mess up your life. He goes, man, that, that's the truth. And um, I said, but Jesus loves the hell out of us, so we don't have to hold on to hell. You don't have to hold on to that hurt and that pain, the shame and the condemnation of the past. And he starts crying. And he, this guy 
who's drunk with a beer can shouts out. And he said, now this man, now that's a preacher. He's preaching some good things. That guy gave his heart to Jesus. God sobered him up supernaturally and set him free. And that's what sets apart. He didn't know what repentance was because he had never been explained that repentance is just simply turning from the darkness, run into the light. And repentance is not just audible, right? It's, it's actually an action that is assigned to what you say you, you believe, right? You're turning away from all the wicked sins and you're running to the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ. You're running to the light. And as you do this sword, this word, it penetrates between soul and spirit. It's going to get on the inside of you. And the harder you, and the faster you run to Jesus, it's going to penetrate on the inside and part the darkness out of us because the light is the authority that parts all darkness. And so that's the good news. And that man is now born again. Now I've lost track with that man, but what many people don't realize is we can speak this word out of context. And the devil knows the word. The devil knows how to manipulate the word. And so we're missing the heart of what Jesus had to set the captives free to speak truth in love. And mm -hmm. love abounds. And grace abounds. And those are two things in the New Testament that God talks about. Those are two things that abound is grace and love. You know, you just once again shared some very wisdom-filled words. You use the word that is the most powerful word on the planet when we apply it. You mentioned love. I share with, I make sure when I'm out in public, people can see God even when we may not even mention the word Jesus. I share with people that we have to learn to meet people where they're at. And sometimes we have to exercise the fruit of the spirit. And then the th loving thing you did for that gentleman was you touched him. Mm -hmm. Right there, that's validation. You're saying, hey, look, you know, I understand maybe he didn't know consciously, but he felt that he was being validated in, in that one moment. When you feel validated, and let me give you an example. You mentioned about we have to be real and visible. But we live in a world that has challenges. We also live in the world that it's run by power and control. When you first came on the broadcast, I looked and I saw your image. I saw an image of a white male. But there's one thing I know. That's just your image. But I go beyond that. You have a spirit like I do. That spirit is made in the image of Christ. And I say yeah. this. Sometimes people in the past would meet me, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, I don't care what color a person is. I said, brother, can I share a truth with you? If you didn't care really what my color was, why did you bring it up? Meaning sometimes we say things because we think it's kind. But sometimes we have to be real. Sometimes when we meet a person, we do recognize the color they are. But then there's more to it. See, is it more important to be real more so than being kind in a moment? They both serve a tremendous purpose. They're both needed. But in this world as we know it now, the, wor the world as we know it, needs the truth expressed in a kindly manner. Could you share more with us, uh, Brother Lovings? I'll give a demonstration when, when um, and these are real things. That all, all I'm telling you are real life experiences that God has walked me through. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's training and giving downloads. I call it download. You know, many times we, we expect a download in this thing called a gadget or a phone, right? And we expect that download. And uh, if we don't get that, we get upset if it doesn't work. You know, if it's not uh, giving us the information we're searching for. You know, if we get that tenacious about seeking after Jesus and to get the download from him and uh, 
get that counsel of the Holy Ghost to, to, to walk us through every circumstance and every directive. You know, if we would do that, we'd have transformation in the body of Christ in the heartbeat. And uh, we'd see a whole different ball game in America. And so what the Lord showed me, I was in Africa. I was preaching at the Library of Africa. And um, as I was preaching there, um, they, they kept, uh, you know, they kept saying, oh, there's a white man with power. And because uh, we saw healings and miracles. And um, it didn't settle well in my spirit. Because it's not about a white man. It's not about a black man. It's not about an Asian man. It's about the power within. Amen. It's about Jesus. And I get it. Many times people use descriptions, right? It's like, you remember that guy over there? Well, which guy? Well, you know, the, the guy over there, the, the African-American man. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, they use a description. So I don't want to take it out of context because I think many people are taking things out of context. Or mm-hmm. where's that white man, right? With the, you know, the one with the, a, a shiny head, <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't take offense to that. Right. No. And, um, but I was an African, they called me a white man with power. And um, oh, I'm sorry, the first night they called me just a white man, right? There's a white man, a white man. So and then I preached that revival, and then they started calling me a white man with power. And I turned around and I said, listen, you're missing it. You're looking to man instead of looking to the one who is power. You're looking, you need to look to Jesus, Jesus, the Christ, the resurrected one. And so I asked the Lord, Lord, how can I address them? All of a sudden, the Lord gave me a download. And I said, you know what? America is full of African Americans. They come from Africa, and many of them came against their will. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about heritage-wise, right? The, the, they they brought over the uh, Africans um, and enslaved them, and so then they called them um, uh, African Americans. I said, "Well, you know what? I come from America, and and I'm here in Africa." So I want you to just might as well just call me an American African, you know. And so we began to label things. And of course, they had a a hoot with that. But we had a great revival, many, many, many healings and miracles. But it's about loving on people. It's about speaking truth, about encouraging them, helping them overcome what they're dealing with. And the first thing I do is God showed me a long time ago. He gave me a vision. And um, that was back in 2014. And in this vision, um, I'd asked God that morning, I said, God, I want to know what your judgment is. What's your judgment, right? And it's, I don't know about you, but, you know, it's probably not a common question. God, what's your judgment? Many people are saying, I don't want to be judged by God. And I I cried out to God, and then he opened up this vision, and I saw the head of a, a, a lamb. And the head of the lamb, and I literally could see the body, and the body was bleeding, it was bludgeoning, it was hurting. All I could see was red in the body. I couldn't see the color. I always, except for red, it was it was covered by the red blood. And um, and then, as I in the in the vision, I tried to look physically. I was trying to look to the left and to the right. And as I did, the head of the lamb would turn, and it would not let me see the body. And then the Lord spoke, and He said, "Look through my eyes." And I looked through the almond eyes of that lamb, and I could see purely. That body healed. I could see that whole. I could see it free because I, I looked at the lens of Jesus, his eyes. And then the vision stopped and he said 316. So I went back to John 316. And like I said earlier in the program, 318, 319 really speaks it out. It, it shouts it out. It says, depending on the, 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 uh, the version, all right, yes. or the, it says, this is my vertical, this is my judgment that the light has come against condemnation or darkness, right? And so God's judgment is against condemnation. It's against darkness. And it's God wants all this nonsense out of his body. He created you. He created I. He created every child from conception before the heartbeat. He can create every child that's conceived in his image. And he formed them. And God wants us to know him. He created us to know him. So when we begin to seek out and look at anything that's not of truth, I want to see what God sees for you, Greg Norman. I don't want to see what other people think. I want to hear from the Lord what he has in store so that you can fulfill what God's calls you. And I want to be a cheerleader and encourager and as, as God will enable to co-labor to advance that line forward, to mm-hmm. see the kingdom of God advance. And so that's the perspective that God wants, his kingdom perspective, 
is he wants us to know him and trust him. And like I said earlier, you know, it's every uh, tongue, every nation, every form of people that's going to be before the Lamb of God and worshiping the Lamb of God. And so we we might as well get used to it on this side. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and, but many people, I'm just going to go there with this. Many people are confused because they, they've had false teachings within churches. And I'm just going to go there. Mm. Ha, have you ever heard that, that uh, cleanliness is next to godliness? Yes. So that's preached in a lot of churches. Have you ever heard it in church? I've heard it uh, more so everywhere I went. I mean, I yep. heard that expression, even people who don't uh, practice having a relationship with God. Yeah. So that, that terminology is not in the word of God. You can't find it anywhere. And so as we're talking on this topic, you know, and, and listen, I know my heart. I preach in the ghettos of Atlanta where the blood and grip gangs are. I saw 172 of them that Jesus touched, healed, delivered, and saved. So I love all people. I preach in Haiti. I've been, you know, in, in Honduras. I've been in Africa. I've been, so I love all people. But I'm speaking this as a prime example of what the root meaning of that word is. Because mo many people don't even know. And I, so I must share this word. Holiness. Cleanliness is next to godliness is not biblical. And I'll prove it. It is actually taught through the Masons, an occult society. And out of the Masons was birthed forth the KKK. So it meant that the white man or the lighter Caucasian man was cleaner than a darker skinned man. Because that is the root meaning of that. And so it's it, it's a manipulation that it sounds good, but it's not pure, it's not holy, it's not truth. And it brings curses in people's lives, even in the body of Christ. There was a, a dear African-American pastor, I'm saying that specifically for the topic that we're talking about, who is a dear friend of mine. And I love that man. He had me come and preach. And I shared this in his church. And I said, how many believe this is biblical? And they're like, yeah. I said, it's not biblical. And I told him the meaning. I had him put up a sleeve right next to mine. And I said, this is what this means. This is the root meaning of this. And it comes from a cult society that wants to bring destruction to you. And when I said that, there was many people that got angry. And I said, listen, don't throw stones. I'm just the messenger bringing truth and love. I love you. I'm not putting that terminology out of my mouth. But other than an example of truth, because by knowing the truth, it'll make you free. And literally, I had them renounce it and denounce it. And when they renounced it, Jesus Christ moved so powerfully. There were so many healings and miracles. And my brothers and sisters, my dear, dear friends, came onto freedom and holiness. And it broke the curse off their family. It broke the curse off their generational lives. And so that's the hope of Jesus that supersedes all of us. Amen. So mm. that's why God had me look through the lens of Jesus, the lamb, to see the body be whole, to be healed. You know, God gave me another vision where it showed um, literally the Bible belt lit up with the glory fire of God from the Carolinas all the way through. I think I shared that when we were on the phone the other day. And what God spoke to me was he's uprooting the strongholds of the occult societies. And that's in every denomination. That's in every stream, every nationality, every background. It's been grafted into the quote unquote church of America. And it's brought confusion, it's brought curses, it's called has brought abuse because it, it comes with a, a mindset of a brotherhood, which is a secret society. And so you can't speak anything ill be God, no matter what they've done. Now God still loves them. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not condemning anybody that's caught in it. But God wants to set them free from it. Because we can't serve two masters. There's one. There's mm -hmm. Jesus. And so it's breaking people free from that uh, uh, misunderstanding of manipulation. It's breaking them free so that they can come into the light and let their uh, light shine in Jesus Christ. And whatever's in me, whatever's in you, I pray that the light would shine bright in each of us. And in anything that's in us that's contaminated, listen, it's a, it's a, we're on an equal playing ground. Whatever's not of Jesus has got to go. Amen? Mm -hmm. Whatever's of Jesus, allow it to grow. And so one man plants a seed, another one waters, God grows and gives increase. We're here to plant the seeds of truth to set the captives free. And so that's evangelism. We got to get back to the heart of, of evangelizing. And, you know, the greatest miracle is salvation of a soul. 
So, mm. you know, we many times we're seeking of a healing or a physical healing or emotional healing, and that's good. We need to. But if we don't allow Jesus to become Lord of our life and surrender everything to him as king of our life, as, as, as the mighty position of positions of our life, as, as the hope of glory of our life, then we're going to miss the heart of what he instilled for us to know him. Mm, and wow. so when we know him, we'll mm -hmm. be free because um, by knowing the truth, the Bible says it will make you free. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're going to want to be free at first because your flesh is in there. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we got to be transparent. There's things that like, no, I don't want to believe that. And maybe what I spoke earlier about cleanliness is next to God is maybe that, you know, to some would say, oh, I can't believe that means that because no, granddaddy said that or my pastor said that. Listen, I'm not condemning anybody, but I'm saying this. Whatever's false, we got to get rid of. Whatever's an injection for an infection by the enemy, we got to reject it in Jesus' name. Wow. And then allow the, the purity of the word to cleanse us, to heal us, to free us, because that's the intent of it. Well, Brother Levins, you're speaking truth. And I'm, I'm choosing to listen to your words from my spirit. If, if I may, please, I want to go back a bit. You spoke something that was profound, but I can't let the healing, the opportunity of true healing to take place. You mentioned that you were in Africa. Yes. And there were a lot of Africans around you and they said white man and you felt for that one moment offended because you wanted them to know that you were Christ, you were made in his image. Yes. I want to go deeper because I've been in that same place. Mm -hmm. And one thing I have to look at for me, this may not be your story. I've been in many places where I was the only person of color mm -hmm. surrounded. I've been in places where I heard, you know, a black man. I've been in places where I heard the word N, the N word. Yep. yep. I, I was offended for a moment because I felt in that one moment there was more of the opposite race than me. That's my offense. That's being real. Mm -hmm. Then I recognized when I could get past that truth, because we talk about the truth. Yeah. We talk about the truth makes us free. It's a difference from makes us free than sets us free. But in that one moment when I looked at myself and I said, and it happened to me not long ago on a bus, I had to ride a bus. But what a tremendous yep. lesson. Yes. First, I felt the fear. Then immediately, I had to ask myself, what am I really feeling? Well, I'm feeling there's more of them, quote, than me. I felt that I was teamed up on. That's how we're going to get to the truth. Yes. When we begin to look at the real part of ourselves, the flesh. And sometimes being a man, my flesh gets hurt. My belief system. My thoughts, it gets triggered because of my story. But when I can release and say, you know what? That's not really who I am. I was triggered because of something that I thought I was. But when I go deeper and I can say, I have a body, but I'm made in the image of Jesus Christ. Yes. And I get to experience that freedom. And that's what I think the world needs. It's very, to talk about race in our country, it's very sensitive. Yeah. But the yes, reason sir. I could talk about it with you, brother, is I know your heart. Mm -hmm. I know you're not out to hurt me. And even if, oh. yeah, and even if anyone was, I still have to be responsible to maintain my inner peace, no matter what happens. And if I find myself not at peace, I can't blame the other person because you think of me in a way that I don't think of myself. I have to go to God quickly and say, God, I'm feeling all this fear and I feel a separation from you at this time. Father, help me get back to the place 
where I can see the way that you see, Father. Could you share with us, Brother Stan? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for allowing me to, you know, to, to be transparent here because I see so much hurt that is unnecessary. You know, the Paul says, I, you know, I don't want you to be ignorant about these things, right? Yes. That's what Paul said. Gotcha. Because I believe so much of what we've been taught is is literally wives' tales and manipulation has been passed down from generation to generation and hurts and the pains of the past and never got dealt with by our forefathers and foremothers. So the venom kept spewing over into every generation, right? Gotcha. And so those things of darkness is biting into the flesh because, uh, you know, you know, Paul took and, and slung that viper back into the fire. Let it be scorned. Let's torch all this garbage. Let's torch all this. You know, a couple of things. Let me go re uh, retro back here briefly. When when I was in Africa, and they said uh, the white man, which that didn't offend me, but when they said the white man uh, with power. What was what was um, there was a righteous stirring in my spirit was the fact that they were looking to man and they weren't looking to the one who was within this man. They weren't looking to Jesus. They were literally shifting and looking elsewhere. And so it's it's not about the flesh, man. There there's good, bad, and different in each and every one of us. And God wants to heal. He wants to mend. He wants to cleanse. He wants to transform. When I look back to my history. You know, my daddy, my biological daddy, that's why I'm staying love as a second. But, you know, my biological daddy, he was an abuser. He abused all of his kids. He molested me at the age of seven. He, um, uh, of course, my mom said, and she raped me at the age of eight for a pack of cigarettes. Um, my, my five sisters were violated. I mean, there was a long list of abuse. And yet he confessed to be a Christian, but he didn't know Jesus. And, and so... He would also talk to you, say you were my basketball coach, and uh, he would talk to you as, as, you know, respect you. But as soon as he walked around, I don't, I'm going to be real. What he would do is start spewing out a bunch of venom and calling a bunch of names. And I took offense to that back before I knew Jesus. I took offense to the fact that he was speaking out against the coach that I respected or a teammate that I respected. Because I grew up in a white ghetto next to the black ghetto next to the Hispanic ghetto. And I began friends with all those in the ghetto, <laughs> you know, because, man, I had some friends that would stand up for me from the black ghetto where the white ghetto, they, they came against me. And I had to fight those guys physically. I was in over 50 fights by the time I was a freshman in high school. And so the majority of that, and I'm going to justify that. I'm not trying to bring that up to glorify that. That's the only way of, of, of knowledge that I knew to fight. And to protect my sisters. Most of it was to protect my sisters from those predators in the world that was punking on them, trying to abuse them. But yet my the worst enemy in my whole life was my own biological daddy that was abusing me and abusing my sisters. So I was out in the world protecting my sisters when my daddy was violating them. And so I'm sharing this from experience. So when I came to know Jesus, God put it on the inside of me to, to bring transformation and to bring healing. And later, by the way, I, I was blessed to lead all five of my sisters to the Lord, my mama to the Lord, you know, my nephews to the Lord, my nieces, my relatives, 120 plus at my grandmother's home growing celebration came to know Jesus. And even my biological dad, my worst enemy on this side, he came to know Jesus. I was blessed to lead him to Jesus on his deathbed. And he got delivered from the demons that were tormenting him. The Bible says we battle not flesh and blood. It's spiritual principalities of darkness that we battle against. And what we've seen and what I grew up in was, I'll just say it this way. My biological dad, mm -hmm. he taught me how to be. And how, excuse me, he taught me how not to be so much. And nobody could ever train me how he taught me not to be in order for me to be who, what my true father commissioned me to be. In other words, he was bipolar opposite of what a true heavenly father had in store with the download. And so where my daddy had hatred and vile and anger and rage and sexual abuse, force, shame, torment, all that, that was generational curses that needed to be broken. And it was broken in Jesus name right here. I was blessed to see the power of God transform a whole family and to see that generational curse break off so many lines. So it's it's um, people would say, well, he was racist. No, 
He was ignorant of truth. And yes, there was racism there, but he didn't understand how to run the race that God commissioned him to be. And so what God sent me to do as I started going into the ghettos of Indianapolis where, where you know, the, the death rate and the murder rate in Indianapolis is higher right now than per capita than Chicago. Mm. And so then God sent me into Atlanta where the blood and grip gangs are. And I was one of the only few Caucasians there. But there was 172 people that gave the heart to Jesus. Many of them in the blood and crypt gangs were coming to know Jesus. They had teardrops flowing over the tatted up drops, teardrops, where they had murdered one, two, three people that, that it was covered by the healing cleansing. And Jesus Christ was healing them from within. And so I'm sharing this from a, a walked out transformational thing where the enemy tried to train me up to be a certain way. And he was using my daddy, my biological daddy. But that's not who God commissioned me to be. Matter of fact, those demons in my dad had, had attacked me one time, Brother Greg. Those demons had attacked me multiple times. And one of them, one of the times uh, before it attacked me, it said, I did not raise you to be who you are today. And I said, no, I got born again, bought by the blood of Jesus to be who my heavenly father has commissioned me to be in Jesus' name. And those demons got raging mad, and they said, I, I, didn't, I didn't give you permission to touch my three boys, which were my nephews, that had been abused and hurt. And, and, and I said, that's right. They got born again. You didn't tell me. You didn't commission me, but I got the great commission, and I have all authority in Jesus' name to love them on to Jesus, and I led them all to Jesus. And then he physically came to attack me and to punch me in the ministry center. He came to full throttle. He was six foot two and a, and a quarter, about 225. And when he went to hit me right here in the center of my forehead, God quickened me and said, stand. And then when I stood, it was quickened by the Holy Ghost. It was not me. He quickened me. And when I stood, I felt the punch, but it felt like an index finger touched my forehead. And all of a sudden, I blinked my eyes briefly. And I look up and literally, I believe it was the angel of the Lord, but whatever it was, literally shot him back about 12 to 15 feet. And he was on the ga ground gasping for air. God protected me, drove out the enemy. And then God told me to turn him over to Satan to be sifted so that his soul shall be saved. And that was the last day that he ever attacked me and ever got away with it. Wow. And so it was 10 years later on his deathbed that I was blessed to drive those demons out and see him set free in Jesus' name. I'm sharing this with you. Because all that racism, perceived racism, all that hostility, perceived hostility and rage, it was there. All that was a demonic force that was infecting that man. And Jesus came to break those chains and to set him free. That's the hope that God has for everyone that's watching this today. Can I share something with you, Brother Stan? And I really appreciate your openness. And this is Thank something you, uh, I don't know why certain things I see. And it's not to criticize or judge, but it's our mindset. You mm -hmm. mentioned a few moments ago where you were sent to different, quote, ghettos. You named in what, Indian, Indiana? Or? Indian. Indianapolis, yes. Um, what else? Uh, actually, Atlanta, down Atlanta where the Blood yeah. and Grip Kings are. Yeah, but, and several other locations, yeah. I want to bring something to your attention. I believe most of those, quote, ghettos you were sent to mm -hmm. were people of color. Majority of them, yes. Yep. I want to share something else with you. This is an eye opener. We call that the ghetto. It's no different than what the modern church itself represents. Absolutely. You know, at least... They're being who they are. Mm -hmm. In the modern day church as we know it, there's corruption, mm -hmm. there's racism. And yes. we call the other the ghetto. Why I bring this up, we're so quick to label things. Yep. But what we have to recognize if we're made in the image of Christ. What's going on in my house of worship? What's going on in my house? What's going on inside of myself? Yes. See, I believe that's where we have to travel 
we have to travel once again right back to the general foundation to clean our own self up first. Mm -hmm. What appears to be a ghetto is really a reflection of me inside, if you really think about it. Everything in our life is a mirror. Every single thing in our life existence really mirrors what we are inside as a society. So we're all trapped in that jungle. Some of us are now waking up to who we really are. What we recognize is this. This world controlled us. It dumbed us down. It makes us believe this big lie that you're better, you're poorer. It's all a lie. It's a lie. lie. So could you take us a little further, brother? Uh, Yes. Lovins, please. Well, first of all, I appreciate your honesty. And and when I said earlier about the the ghettos, you probably couldn't see my hand, but I was doing quote unquote right here, quote unquote, the white ghetto, the black ghetto, the Hispanic ghetto, because the perception (laughs) is that these people don't have any value. But the reality is the blood coming of Jesus grants us value. He created us all in his image for his glory. And there are treasures in every soul that's ever been born. Whether they're born again or not, there's still treasures in them. And that's why the devil's working so hard to steal the treasures. That's our souls from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we who win souls, the Bible says he who wins souls is wise. It takes a wisdom of God to transform a life. It takes a discernment of the Holy Spirit to discern what spirits we're dealing with. And it takes understanding to have compassion for someone. And it takes those things so we can instill that truth to set the captives free. As a matter of fact, everyone is watching right now. I just feel compelled by the Holy Spirit. Everyone is listening and watching right now. You are treasured by God. Jesus Christ paid the full price, the ultimate price, to set the captives free. Jesus is the Son of Man and a Son of God. And so the Son of Man was nailed. He took on sin, sickness, disease, and death. He took on every form of abnormality, every form of hatred, every form of rage, every form of deception, debauchery, all forms of sexual perversions. He nailed to the cross of Calvary. So the Son of Man was nailed, and the Son of God prevailed. The Son of God said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what to do. But Jesus nailed the ill-begotten will of the flesh to the cross, and then they laid him in a tomb, and he descended, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he resurrected gloriously to give you and I abundant life today. No matter what you've been through, I've been through a living torment, hell, and a white ghetto home, <laughs> because God wanted to set me free from that. And it reminds me in scripture, it says, could anything good come from Nazareth? Well, Jesus, in Acts 10, 38, said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Come on, he said that specifically. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and the Holy Spirit. Yes. And he went around doing good and healing all. That's A-L-L with my southern draw. i got to make sure that's spelled out right. Hey, healing all who were oppressed or attacked by the devil. For God was with him. Right here, right now, you can be set free by the power of the one who is a liberator, who is a lover of your soul, who wants to liberate you from every form of bondage, hurt, pain, shame, torment, forced shame, whether sexual abuse, verbal abuse, uh, infection, disease, abnormalities, broken bones. Jesus the Christ is here to set you free. And that's the gospel truth, the good news for each and every one of us. Don't reject him. Lean into him, trust him, and abide in him. And I'm just going to pray this prayer, and it's from your heart, because the Bible says, for it's with your heart that you believe and are justified with your mouth that you confess and are saved. God will do a beginning work in you to help set you free and set you on this journey to continue to overcome the obstacles. And the Bible says we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, and the word of your testimony. So as God sets you free and you begin to, trust him today, then it's up to you to go testify what Jesus the Christ has done for you. Not what Stan Lovins has done for you. Not what my brother, my dear brother, my brother in Christ, Greg Norman's done for you. No, it's what Jesus the Christ has done for you. And so today, right now, it's a matter of turning away from darkness and running to the light because that's what Jesus did. He did an about face on that cross. He turned his back on darkness because the cross is not to be glorified. The cross literally was for the lawbreaker. It was for the murderer, the rapist, the pedophiles. And Jesus, who was sinless, 
with purity and holiness, covered it up for you and I to be free from it. So right now, in the name of Jesus, from your heart, just cry out to God and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on a cross for me. Jesus, thank you for taking on my shame, all forced shame, all sickness, all disease, every virus, every form of contamination. Jesus, I thank you for nailing on that tree to set me free. Jesus, I believe that you rose from the dead, that you conquered death, hell, and the grave. And everything that you nailed on that cross, I can be free from today. So Jesus, as best I know how, I receive you. I believe in you. I trust in you to come into my heart, to come into my soul, to be my God. Teach me, Lord. Show me, Lord. Empower me by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to be the individual that you created me to be. And I love you, Jesus, because you first loved me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. My friend, if you said that prayer and you believe that in your heart, it's a beginning work. It's not an end all. It's a beginning relationship with Jesus. And that light, this word, this beautiful gospel comes alive in you and it's in your heart and soul. And read the word. Reach out to Brother Greg. Reach out to me, Stan Lovins the second. I mean, stanlovins.com or revivalsforjesus.com. Let us know what Jesus has done in your life today and testify to others what Jesus has done and his goodness of God. Man, I wish we had more time because I tell you, I feel like there's a bunch of people that need healing. There's physical healings that need to be uh, manifested right now. And I, I just speak life into your backs, your your shoulders, the rotator cuff. Literally right now, neck. I feel fire on my neck. There's healing in your neck right now. Whoever that is, God's healing your neck. I command it to come back to order in Jesus' name. The migraines in your head right now, I break it now. I command them to go by the authority of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for your divine healing down through the leg. There's a leg where you have a sciatic nerve that's been impinged. I command the hips to be shifted and the leg to be whole and to be healed in the name of Jesus. I feel a heaviness in my chest right now. Someone's going through a heaviness. There's a spirit of heaviness on you. And, and yep, you were sick. You were sick. You got attacked with COVID and the pneumonia set in. Right now, we break that off you right now. We speak to pneumonia. We command you to loose that spirit of um, uh, affliction, that spirit of infirmity. I command off of you now and healing to reside. For this individual in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I could share something with you. Just a, this will take only a brief moment. I really like you, uh, Brother Lovins. Yeah. I love you as well, brother. I'm going to sit with that for a moment. Hmm. You ever, you ever experience that someone gives you a compliment and immediately we had to feel that we had to give it back? Mm -hmm. You know why I used to do that, Brother Levin? Because I couldn't really accept it. Think mm -hmm. about it. When you said, I love you too, brother. I had to sit with it for a moment mm -hmm. because our minds tend to reject it. Mm -hmm. But I wanted it to saturate in my spirit so I could accept it. Amen. And I just want to say one thing. You were a wonderful gift today. Mm -hmm. I threw some fastball pitches at you. Not easy to answer. But you immediately went to Jesus. You didn't budge. Mm -hmm even though you might have felt a little discomfort like I, you still went immediately to Christ. And I just want to say one more thing. You were a wonderful guest. I won't forget this moment. But I want to share with you. I don't live, my wife and I don't live too far away. 
from this community called Newport, Rhode Island. Mm. 30, 40, $50 million homes. Wow. To have a $10 million home there is probably average. And they have their certain section that people may call a ghetto. But can I share something with you? Some of Absolutely. the residents in those 30, 40, 50, there was a actor that just uh, purchased a home there. I don't want to give any names. But what I recognize too, where they don't know Christ, they also live in a ghetto. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the word, the true meaning of the word ghetto, poverty in spirit. Yeah, absolutely. I can live in the, I can live in the ghetto yes. and still be wealthy in heart. Would you like to close off, uh, Brother uh, Lovins, please? Brother, it's such an honor to be on here today. I love your heart and your transparency for the kingdom and uh, just being real. It's a joy to be with those co-laborers, uh, with those who are genuine and true and uh, give all glory to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and that's you, my friend. I thank God for you. And let that land of the tribe of Judah roar. We need to testify and to see people set free. Jesus came for the downcast and brokenhearted. Praise God that he set you and I free. Amen. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there's those who um, I just want to encourage. Posture yourself from a position of victory in Jesus Christ. Take your proper seat in Jesus Take that proper seat in him. Let the living waters flow and let the fire of God mold you into what he's assigned for you to be. That's the purpose of God. It's a renewing your mind, transforming of the, the heart to come in purity and perfect love. I'll repeat this again. Perfect love. Cast out all fear. Yes. Don't settle for fear. Take authority in Jesus name, but do so in love. Because the Bible even commands us to love our enemies. Yeah. You may think they're your enemies, and, and maybe they are. But love your enemies because they're entrapped and ensnared by demons that God wants to set them free from. And maybe, just maybe, God wants to utilize you, my friends, to go set somebody free and help them out. Help them overcome and walk them through. That's the purpose of, of God. Simply bring in healing to the hurting and bring transformation to the heart and soul for the kingdom of God. And let's, we need all hands on deck. We need you. We need each and every one to come to the Father's heart and surrender everything and then come alive and advance it forward and take this nation back by the force of love and the grace that abounds in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And once again, could you share your website from the, from the Yes. State? It's uh, revivals, plural, revivals for F O R Jesus.com or Stan Lovins.com. And are you doing any? We, we should arrange something to have you come to the East Coast, you know. So. Well, it's interesting. Next week, I'm, I'm scheduled to be out in Philadelphia and, and Jersey, but that's just a quick uh, turn of event. I'll be ministering there in Jersey to actually a pregnancy center and ministering to those women to help them. Um, you know, be refreshed and, and restored and strengthened and uh, to save souls and save souls and save babies. And uh, but I can rearrange another trip to come right back and, and let's do a, a revival right there in Rhode Island. Come on. <laughs> OK, well, I'll take that up in prayer. And again, I thank you so, so much, brother. Thank Stan. you, my friend. Yep. And God bless you. And if you could hold on for a moment, please. Yes, sir. God bless you and your wife. And God bless you and your family, too.